Hey, welcome back to the last module here in the EDM 830 training series. My name is Dave Kalischuk. I'm the Chief Flight Instructor at Owen Sound Flight Services. Uh, hopefully you've uh, been watching some of the other training modules, one through five, number six here is the last one. We're going to talk about the engine data management system in flight and some things that we can do. This is a relatively short video compared to some of the other ones. Uh, there's not a whole lot that we can really manage in flight. I mean, there are some things that are really important, but uh, not quite as much detail as uh, we've been discussing in the previous ones. So let's jump into it. Um, so one of the main things that we can evaluate is in cruise flight. So in cruise flight, um, there's certain parameters that we can monitor. And uh, traditionally, the EGT is one that we can watch for. So um, what we can do is use the normalize view in cruise flight to um, watch um, uh, watch the EGTs and make sure that they're sort of staying steady. Once we reach our cruising altitude and we level off and we lean the mixture out, um, then we can um, set up uh, the uh, normalized view and then we can see even minor variations of EGT as we are on our cross country. And the advantage of that is if um, one of the uh, EGTs starts to rise or drop relative to the others, um, then we can see and maybe uh, find out why that's happening. So uh, let's just run you through this uh, quick video here from JPI and um, we'll go from there. In cruise, be alert for uneven EGTs or CHTs in carbureted engines. Make fine adjustments to throttle, then RPM, then mixture to minimize the differences between the highest and lowest EGT, shown as the difference or DIF value. So uh, if, let's see what we got here. Um, if in normalized view, um, we saw one EGT start to creep up over time over the others, uh, that would be an indication that um, the temperatures are hotter in there than the other cylinders, and, or rather the other exhaust uh, manifolds. And then why is that? Well, uh, perhaps a leaner mixture is causing that rise in temperature. Um, perhaps uh, one of the spark plugs isn't firing as well as it should be. So there's a number of diagnostic tools we can uh, look at and um, the uh, user manual, the operating manual for the EDM 830, 730 series has a number of troubleshooting uh, tips and techniques in there that I showed you on the previous video. So um, we can use normalized uh, mode for view for long cross countries and whereas we tend to use percentage view for most training flights because we are uh, often making lots of power changes. If you're going to make a number of power changes, then normalized view is not great because every time you make that power change, it's going to show you a significant impact on the screen because of the sensitivity of the graph. So you want to make sure that you're stabilized in flight before you uh, initiate, initiate the normalized view. Um, another thing that you can obviously do in cruise flight is um, get your mixture lean properly, and that's part of a whole other um, um, uh, training module that we're going to be um, uh, creating. Just haven't decided yet if it's going to be, uh, if we're going to get it online here or not, but it's called um, Advanced Leaning Techniques and it deals with using the lean fine mode of the EDM 830. And uh, it's a very uh, excellent technique to be able to exactly pinpoint the mixture setting that you want for the performance out of the engine, whether that is uh, best power or best economy. Um, how much rich of peak or at peak are you running compared to your percentage horsepower? What's the danger of being at peak or rich of peak? Um, then we get into the red box, red fin. If you've watched any of the stuff from Mike Bush or Savvy Aviation, there's a tons of literature on that. Again, I'll put some links down below. But anyway, that's for a more advanced module. What I would say is in cruise, you're going to set up, lean the mixture, and on a long cross country flight, you're probably going to use normalized view if you're not going to adjust power so that you can see those minute changes in EGT and then you can uh, troubleshoot that system if you uh, notice any discrepancies. So you're watching for uneven EGTs or CHTs or abnormal patterns and also um, the diff. Uh, diff is one of the options that um, you can set as a parameter. So we have our 10 linear gauges and uh, we don't have diff in there so this is one of the ones that we might put in our numerical display on a long cross country. Uh, just to measure the um, span between the um, hottest and coolest um, EGT. And it will show us that. Uh, so it displays the, the two squares um, around the cylinders that have the diff, and it will show us what the diff is. So the diff between number three 
and four is 80 Fahrenheit. So what, how much diff is, is too much diff? <laughs> What's the deal with the diff? Um, well, so far, what the diff does tell us is it could be an indication of um, uh, plug fouling, like I'd mentioned with uh, too lean of a mixture, or worn valves or intake leaks, that kind of thing. So um, like an air, like an intake leak in the induction system, um, if one of your cylinders was not getting the proper ratio of fuel and air, if there was a leak in the induction system, then it might be running leaner, and that leaner running um, cylinder would show up as a hotter EGT. So there's ways that we can troubleshoot those things in flight. But uh, as for how much diff is too much diff, um, a normal diff uh, on EGT for carbureted engine, something in the 120 to 150 range as per um, the uh, engine, um, the manual for the EDM 830. Now we have uh, seen in the 172Ms just over a few months of testing, and most of our diffs are less than 100. Um, typically in cruise flight, they can be as low as 30 or 40. So uh, we, we set our diff alarm. You can set a, an alarm for the diff uh, wherever you like. It defaults, I think, at 500. We dropped ours down, I think, to 300, just so that it alerts us when there's something significant, significant happening. Um, but uh, you can set that however you like. It's user customizable. So watching out for the difference in the span of EGTs um, is a good thing to look for. I'd say it's m much more relevant than watching for a specific EGT number, unless of course you're um, trying to lean the engine to a specific setting, then you're going to be leaning relative to EGT uh, versus the traditional method of leaning relative to RPM. So that's covered in the advanced leaning technique uh, module as well. Uh, so that's cruise flight, EGT diff and span and um, normalized mode to watch for discrepancies in uh, the EGT bars. And I would, again, only really be worried about that on long cross-country type of flight. For the, most of the training flights we do, we just stay in percentage mode most of the time because we're making multiple power changes. Um, in the descent, we've got some cool stuff with uh, shock cooling. Uh, let me show you the shock cooling video here full screen. So Lycoming has some recommendations for shock cooling. This is the, the rate of change of temperature uh, in Fahrenheit per minute. So have a quick look at this. In descent, manually select the shock cooling display to track it during your letdown. Rates of up to 50 degrees per minute are to be expected, depending on your engine's configurations. All right, so very quickly, um, we can watch for the difference, in, or sorry, how fast the um, uh, cylinder is cooling, the, the coolest cylinder. So it, it's a shock cooling alarm, essentially. Um, Lycoming says uh, we should not exceed uh, 50 Fahrenheit per minute for our engines. So we're watching for that shock cooling factor uh, when the cylinders start to cool rapidly. You know, we can see this in the training environment when we do some of the air work exercises like power off stalls. We suddenly reduce that power all the way to idle from a cruise power. And uh, that's a big, um, that's a big uh, reduction in heat, especially in the wintertime if we're at three or 4,000 feet and it's minus 20 and we're going from cruise power to idle power would be a significant impact on the shock cooling. So it uh, will help us to um, be more gradual in our power reductions. Um, so it's indicated in the numerical display in, as a rate in uh, degrees per minute. And um, here's the uh, Lycoming um, uh, service letter. So it's uh, service letter 1094 Delta and it um, talks about you should be really trying to keep your um, temperature change uh, less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit per minute to avoid shock cooling. And actually surprisingly enough we've even seen uh, temperatures up as high uh, shock cooling or at least cooling as much as 30 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit just from a normal um, circuit pattern. So when we're in the downwind and we're making the power reduction to the base leg going from cruise power to 1500 RPM, let's say, uh, we can easily get 30 to 50 um, Fahrenheit difference uh, out of that. So, you know, it's, it's not that hard to exceed this number, at least in the 172M. So just be cognizant of it and try to put in place um, things that uh, you can use to mitigate that. Uh, be aware of the airwork exercises if you're a student training things like power off stalls and forced approaches, um, that kind of stuff can really cause uh, excessive cooling. So, you know, that's kind of neat too. In the past, um, we've come up with internal policies on uh, engine failure practice in the winter versus the summer. In the summertime, we will do um, forced approach engine failure practice with the power at idle. We'll bring the power all the way out 
Um, so we're only at idle power and we'll uh, glide down to a field. And on the way down, we'll do these engine clearing, engine warming uh, procedures where we bring the power back up uh, to full power or to a high cruise power and then back to idle again, typically every 500 feet or so um, we will do that. And uh, that helps to kind of keep things warm, keep things clean. And we've always said uh, this can help you know, to prevent the excessive cooling. And we've never really had a metric to measure that. Um, we've always just said this is what we do. And then um, in the winter time, when it's uh, minus 10, minus 20 outside, um, we don't do that practice. We uh, try to simulate um, a zero power condition uh, or an idle power condition um, by using about 1500 RPM and something like 15 to 20 degrees of flap. And the two of those give a similar descent profile, something in the 500 feet per minute range. And uh, that way we can uh, mitigate uh, excessive engine cooling in the winter. And so the previously our practice has been to do that and we've said this is a good idea, we believe, because of these reasons. But now um, with the engine monitor, we can actually measure uh, what's happening. We can measure the shock cooling factor in both scenarios. We can measure the actual CHT in both scenarios, we can measure oil temperature in both scenarios. So it's really amazing to see um, those uh, airwork exercises that we've done always in the past and the um, sort of proactive countermeasures we put in place based on essentially theory. Um, but now we can actually see the effects uh, right then in real time. So it's a more of a tangible thing, which again is just um, adding to the value of uh, of why we're happy to put these engine monitors in and spend the money to do that. So it's kind of a neat thing to see, anyway, just as an aside. Um, some engine problems associated with uh, constant shock cooling, uh, like homing outlines, a number of them here. So excessively worn ring grooves accompanied by broken rings, cracked cylinder heads, warped exhaust valves, bent push rods, spark plug fouling. All that stuff um, is very expensive, as you can imagine. It's all, all adds up. It's all money. So if we can mitigate that, if we can try to manage uh, temperature swings better, then uh, we can add to the service life of the engine. And if we can do that, we can keep our costs lower. And if we can do that, it costs that much less money to learn how to fly. So um, that just helps keep aviation accessible for everybody. Uh, so a little bit of money in um, equals um, more money out. And that's kind of the theory here. And a heck of a lot of fun in the meantime using this new technology. So. Uh, there's our motivating factor right there. Um, so the, the problem with the shock cooling uh, feature of the EDM is it's kind of laggy. It's pretty slow. Um, so it's got a bit of lag to it. So if you were to basically um, pull the power all the way to idle very quickly uh, and watch that uh, number change, it would be at zero for about you know uh, five or seven seconds. And then it would go to minus 20 and then a few seconds later minus 30 and then minus 40 and you know it it takes it takes a while before it actually registers the final result of how cool it was uh, late, very likely due to the um, the sampling rate uh, how fast it's actually getting the data I think it's every six seconds it it gets data so I think you can also actually change that sampling rate to something faster maybe that's something to look at but um, the problem is um, by the time you get to see the final end result, uh, it's probably too late and <laughs> you've already exceeded your minus um, 50 Fahrenheit per minute. So uh, essentially you need to learn the scenarios that lead to shock cooling and say, okay, now when I do a power off stall, I'm going to bring the power from cruise to idle and I'm going to count to five, uh, you know, instead of, instead of just uh, arbitrarily pulling it back. So you need to apply kind of what you learn in doing it once to future scenarios so you don't do it again. And um, ultimately, you know, your flight instructor can show you this too and say, okay, we're going to do power off stall. This time we're going to put the shock cooling number in the numerical display. I want you to bring the power back slowly in five seconds to idle. And uh, while we're waiting for this thing to slow down and stall, have a look here at the, at the end result of this number and what we actually get. Um, so if you can observe um, the situations that lead to shock cooling, then you can avoid them and you can be proactive in that respect. So uh, then you can apply you know, proper procedures um, with engine care in mind. So uh, monitor the cold parameter during um, reductions in power and, and evaluate what you're doing to make sure that it's a good procedure. Um, if the cooling rate exceeds the alarm limit, it will flash. Our alarm limit set at 50, which is a Lycoming recommendation. You know, if we go to 60, it's not going to be the end of the world. 
Um, but again, the thing is um, proactive and engine care, and so take a note of um, all the things you did to break it, and don't break it again. <laughs> That's the best I can say. <clears throat> um, once the shock cooling uh, basically resolves itself and things stop cooling, because even if you pull the power to idle, you'll see that number um, peak, and then you know it's not cooling any faster after that point. It's really the initial change. Then eventually um, it will turn the alarm back off and turn back to normal. So um, monitor shock cooling when you're doing things uh, like air work or even circuits um, so you can see the effect uh, of what it's doing. And uh, prior to descending, maybe you're going to do a power off descent or you're going to do a reduced power descent. Um, it's interesting to see uh, how that is affecting um, the temperature swing in the, uh, in the engine itself, in the CHTs and, and EGTs. So, um, or at least, yeah, so keep an eye on that in this case and um, see what you uh, can discover. Um, last slide here is just about uh, the shutdown. So, um, you know, we've incorporated the EDM into the startup and uh, we're also going to incorporate it into the shutdown by recording the uh, fuel that we've used on our, uh, in our flight. And we have little flight slips that we take out to the aircraft on the clipboards that now we can write that fuel remaining in. So that fuel remaining comes back into the office and gets entered into our, um, our Airbooks program. And uh, then we can see um, what is actually left in the tank. So the next guy knows uh, how much fuel is going to be there. And it's pretty accurate because it's you know, driven by the EDM, plus or minus the accuracy of the pilot who entered the initial data. But uh, it's pretty cool. So uh, yeah, we can record the amount of uh, fuel that we've uh, used and or the amount of fuel remaining on the flight slip and um, we can see um, the effects of our flight and our, and our leaning and everything. So uh, that's basically it for um, the six modules of the EDM 830. Um, we covered a lot and the introduction is one of the longest because I like to talk a lot. Um, entering fuel and indexing modes and um, the toggle switch and CHTs and EHTs and bar graphs and all the linear gauges and data fields that we can have and manually indexing, automatic indexing, the black button, the white button, what they do, how we can use this in the pre-flight scenario to um, troubleshoot and have a safer flight experience overall, how we can use it to manage fuel, how it integrates with the GPS, how we can use it in flight to see subtle changes um, and maybe uh, even troubleshoot a little bit uh, in flight by watching EGT bars go up and down and uh, in descending and post-flight. So really the, the EDM is an, it's really an amazing piece of technology. Uh, in my opinion, it's well worth the investment that we put into it uh, that we will recoup, I believe, in engine uh, care and engine longevity and also um, just in uh, advancing our training as pilots. You know, like I've said before, um, uh, the, the whole purpose of this aviation industry from a training standpoint is to constantly be learning and there's always something to learn. And th that's a very exciting thing. That's a really cool part of this is you're never going to know it all. And um, so you got to kind of pick and choose <laughs> what you want to learn. I tend to lean toward technology. I love to see um, integrations of technology. I love to see a mix of old and new. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw the um, attitude indicator in FWQ in the next couple of years replaced. Um, by a digital uh, Garmin G5. But, um, you know, we're not going to go full glass um, because that's not what this airplane is about, but uh, an integration of new tech into old um, uh, helps to combine the simplicity of a, a basic airplane system to, so, you, you know, you don't have to read through a thousand page, um, say, Garmin G1000 manual uh, before you ever get to go flying. Not that that's always the case, but there's a, there's a certain limit um, in the ab initio side of training that uh, starts to not make sense. So we'd like to try and keep it a mix of old and new and that's kind of what we do here. So I hope you've enjoyed these videos. I hope they've uh, helped to shed some light on this engine monitor and its complexity. There's a lot to learn and so we wanted to put some stuff out here for you guys on, uh, on YouTube for free and something to do while everything else is shut down or any other time of the year. Uh, I'm hoping to be back up and running soon and as soon as lockdown number 2.5 lifts and uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you guys all around the school again and in the air. Until then, be safe, study up, stay fresh, stay current, uh, stay recent, and uh, be proficient. And, and uh, just enjoy flight training. Enjoy the process and the journey. Thanks very much. I'm Dave Kalischuk, Owen Sound Flight Services. And um, have a great day. Ciao.